Hey, good morning. Good morning. Hopefully you had the opportunity to say hello to somebody next to you, get to know them just a little bit. My name's Dave. And man, we're so glad you're with us this morning for worship. Whether this is your first time with us at Ethos or maybe you've been with us for a long time, we're, we're honored that you're back this morning as we wrap up this month-long journey of prayer and fasting that we've been leaning into together. It's been an amazing month. God's been at work in some really significant ways, but uh, we're excited for this season that we're getting ready to come into. Hey, this morning, we're going we're gonna to take a moment right kind of out of the gate, right at the beginning. We're going to spend some time praying for what's going on in Ukraine. And I want to give us some context for why we do this. If you've been around Ethos, we, we do this pretty consistently where we stop and we just pray about what's happening in the world. And I want to be clear, we don't do this just because your social media feed is filled with stuff that's going on in Ukraine. We don't just do this because it's the latest tragedy in a really fallen world, although that's certainly true. Um, we do this because we actually believe this is so close to the heart of God and because we believe it's what the people of God have been invited into. There's that moment where Jesus, you know, about a week before he was crucified, he goes into the temple and it says he sees the state of God's house and he's so frustrated and disrupted by it. Maybe you remember the story. He, he makes the whip and he clears out the temple. And he makes this statement that's been resonating with me all week as I've thought about what we've seen unfold in the world. This is the statement that he says. He goes, this house was supposed to be a house of prayer for all the nations. He goes, the, the people of God, he goes, this was supposed to be the place where we, we came together and we lifted up prayers on behalf of what was going on in the nations. And it's one of the brilliant realities of, of the church. The church is both this local and global reality. That we are a local people gathered around King Jesus, living on mission with King Jesus, but we are part of a global family. And when one part of the family is hurting, aching, struggling, all of us feel it. You know, what my parents will often say is a parent can only be as happy as their saddest child. And I believe that, that the church when we really function as this local and yet global community, the ache of what's going on in the world really begins to stir in us as well. So here's what we're going to do for the first few minutes of our time together. We're going to pray over what's happening in Ukraine. Maybe you don't even know what to pray. So I'll just give you a few things to think about. You can pray for families that are being separated in the chaos right now. You can pray for the physical protection of the people that are under attack. You can pray for the leaders that are making decisions that are impacting so many people. You know, one of the things that I've been struck by over the years is old men tend to make war. Young men pay the price of it. That so often shots get called and then there's the next generation is sent out into it. And whatever you think about it, I just go, it is tragic. It is tragic what's happening in the world. And so we're just going to stop and we're just going to pray. We're going to pray for the church. We're going to pray for people. We're going to pray for families. Wherever you feel led by God, we're going to trust that he's going to take our collection of prayers and he's going to receive and he's going to move. So if you're comfortable, I just encourage you to stay standing. You could turn to two or three people that you came with and you can just pray together out loud for Ukraine. If you don't want to pray with the people next to you, just very politely, you can say, I just want to pray on my own. And that's, that's totally okay. Let's take a few minutes together right now, pray for what's happening. You can get in groups of two, three, four. Let's do that as we enter into our time of worship. Love you all. Welcome.
Let's sing this together. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest.
reminds us that the heavens declare the glories of God. The skies proclaim the works of his hands. And day after day, they pour out, pour out speech and remind us of God. And the rest of the psalm just unfolds in this beautiful, poetic telling of God's intimate involvement in all of creation. That he's present and it all glorifies and honors him. And that final verse of Psalm 19 says, so may the meditation of my heart and the words of my mouth be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. And over the last four weeks as a church, we have been praying, we've been fasting, and our eyes have been opened to some of God's activity all around us. And so as an act of worship this morning, we've invited a couple people just to, to testify, how has God been present with you? And as we do this, this is an act of worship. So we're gonna celebrate as we hear the ways that God has been moving and speaking. And we're gonna ask God, will you open up our eyes? Because you're all around us. We want to see you, we want to hear you. So let's listen and let's worship through celebration. My name is Patty Mangum. And um, 
two ways God was present for me during Awaken was through the scripture readings and the ethos community by way of the Zoom prayer calls. And in 2021, when the Zoom prayer call was implemented as a part of Awaken because of the pandemic, I decided to participate. And so I was totally blessed by the prayers offered up during the prayer calls as well as people just showing up and being present. Prayer calls also inspired me to get into the scripture readings that we had beforehand and really dig into to them so that I would be prepared for the time of prayer. And all that was such a blessing last year that one of the goals for me this year during Awaken was to try to make every Zoom prayer call. And the reading before one of the prayer calls was the Lord's Prayer. And something that I read before the prayer call pointed out that the Lord's Prayer is a prayer um, in which Jesus prayed. It, it's a prayer of community. And um, Jesus said, Our Father in heaven, versus saying, My Father in heaven. And that point was something I'd never really thought about or considered. Um, so that being said, one morning during the Awaken, I was in a hot yoga class which I do for physical health reasons and also because it forces me to be still and um, to make room for God to meet me on the mat, so to speak. So if you've ever done it, you know that hot yoga can be kind of intense and requires a good bit of focus. So um, during that class, I was trying to hold a pose, standing on one leg, and um, I started to get off balance. And so in that situation, I usually try to um, think of a scripture or the lyrics to a song, and I just wasn't coming up with anything. And then God reminded me of that prayer call talking about the Lord's Prayer and that it was a prayer community. And he just brought to mind, I could see in my mind, um, all the people on the prayer calls, their faces and the little boxes with people's names in them. And... Um, so I pictured that, and it helped me not to fall over. And I know that holding a yoga pose is not important in the grand scheme of things. Um, but to me, that scenario was a tangible way and a visual picture of how God was present through Scripture and the ethos community during Awaken. And um, what I realized in that moment was that I could apply that same sense of God's presence in the future to more important areas of life when I'm feeling off balance. You're the best, Patty. I I've enjoyed seeing you on those prayer Zoom calls. Uh, my name's Lucas, and uh, God's been present with me through the fast in different ways. Um, one way in general that he uh, communicates with me a lot is through uh, patterns and kind of driving a point home. I don't know if it's because I have a thick skull or something, but sometimes it's hard to let it actually sink in. And, and I've just been thinking about how we all have things we desire and respond uh, different ways to those desires. Uh, God's been teaching me where I need to grow in my response. Uh, before the fast started, um, the verse, cease striving and know that I'm God, uh, really popped out to me and stood out to me. And I just started chewing on that about being still, trusting him and then through the fast through the scripture reading uh, there were a few verses that kind of just kept coming up along the same lines um, a lot of it in Psalm 37 so I, I thought I'd read just a little bit of Psalm 37 it says trust in the Lord and do good dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart commit your way to the Lord trust also in him and he will do it rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. So um, for me, it's tempting to try and go after things that I want or make it, whatever it is, happen. Uh, but I think about how God helped Jacob go from grasping for earthly things uh, to clinging to him, you know, grasping for an inheritance, grasping for all these different things. And then he finally started clung to God and wouldn't let go until God blessed him. And um, he endured in clinging to God. He wouldn't let go. God blessed him and he was changed. And God's helping me too. He's teaching me to stop grasping onto what I want in my strength and trust him to accomplish what is good. I can relax, commit it to him, 
and know that even when I can't quite tell what he's doing, his sovereignty is something I can rest in. He is involved, working, and always trustworthy. Let us continue our worship.
Have a seat. Look at somebody next to you and just let them know. Say, hey, I'm glad you're here today. If you're watching from home, like let somebody you know that you're with or send somebody a text message, just let them know you're grateful for them. Good morning. Good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? You guys good? My name's Aaron. I'm uh, one of the pastors here and just so excited to get this privilege this morning. On the last day of our kind of four weeks of prayer and fasting to open up the Word with you. If you have a Bible, you can up to to John chapter 15 or if you use your phone or whatever you use to track along with us. If you need a Bible, uh, if you're here in the room, we've got Bibles on the bar um, on these communion tables around. Please help yourself. Grab one of those orange Bibles. Uh, We'll be in John chapter 15 here in a few minutes. Um, uh, before, before we jump into that, I just want to hit on, kind of just remind you wh- where we are. I mean, we are, we're at the tail end of four straight weeks of intentional prayer and fasting, of seeking the Lord. You know, it's been so much fun to, to watch our church family, just to watch you really lean in to this process. I've had so many fun conversations of the ways that people are seeing God just work in their lives as they do these simple things of just letting go of some stuff, letting go of food, letting go of social media, letting go of time on on our phones or whatever, and just so that we can take hold of more of God. I've gotten text messages. It's been fun. I've got got a text message from people that that don't even live in our state, and they're like, hey, I've been tracking along with you guys in this prayer and fasting thing. I had one guy text me, and he was like, he said, hey, I've been tracking along with Awaken with Ethos. He goes, I have a question. Do people in your church really go 28 days without eating any food? <laughs> and I was like, I mean, well, yeah, I know some that have, but that's not what all of us do, you know, and I was trying to help him understand just the heart of what we're doing, that this whole season is about us just like taking hold of more of what God has for us, understanding his heart for us and growing our affection for him. And it has been amazing to watch so many of you just step into that. You know, we're in the middle of a, today, a 24-hour prayer vigil that right now there's a team of people at the Ethos office that are praying. There have been people praying nonstop since 5 p.m. yesterday, and they're going to pray all the way through to 5 p.m. today. 
at 5 p.m. tonight, uh, we have a celebration here. I mean, we are going to celebrate. This is how we wind down a season of prayer and fasting is that we come together and we just celebrate God. We celebrate who he is. We celebrate Jesus and all that he's done. And part of that celebration is we have baptisms. And if you've never been to an Ethos baptism night, man, I just encourage you, do whatever you need to do to come tonight. It is it's not a it's not a it's not a worship service. <laughs> it is a it's a party. Like we celebrate, we dance, we sing, we cheer, we rejoice as we watch people go into the water and be buried with Jesus into death to raise into eternal life and their faith in him and it is like the room just erupts and music is it's so fun. It's so fun. I'm trying to sell it. You need to come. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be fun. So 5 p.m. here tonight, we will we'll celebrate baptism. We'll wrap up this season of prayer and fasting. If you want to be baptized or if you have questions about baptism, what is that? Like, what, what is that mark in the life of a follower of Jesus? Why do we do that? Um, there's a card on your seat that says, I want to be baptized. If you even have questions, we encourage you to fill that card out. Drop it in one of these white mailboxes around the room, and someone on our team will reach out to you this afternoon. Like, we want to help you, come alongside you, answer whatever questions you have, teach you what the Bible actually says about following Jesus and where baptism comes in and that. Um, and so if you have questions, fill that out. If you want to be baptized, fill that out, and we'll get back to you. You can also just come tonight. And if you want to get baptized, just show up tonight. We're not going to be like, where's your card? You didn't fill out a card? Sorry, can't do it. Like, if you want to get baptized, come tonight. It's going to be great. So that's tonight. Um, you know, uh, uh, something kind of unrelated to Awaken that I want to just throw out there, put in the radar. We're trying to announce this in as many places as we can, uh, just so that those who need to know about it can know about it. You know, uh, one of the things that I love about our church family is that, you know, not just in this venue, but in other, all of our venues, but here at the cannery, you know, we transform this space from just being a dingy old bar to being like a w space for a worship gathering, like to praise God every Sunday morning. And it takes an army of volunteers that show up here and set out chairs and roll out boards and make coffee and pour communion and do all those things. And if you have ever volunteered for Ethos Church, we just want you to know how grateful we are for you. Like we're so grateful that you would and thankful that you would take your time to serve our church family that way. And so, um, you know, we have decided to say thank you, like in a very tangible way. Uh, we've organized kind of a night together just to have fun. So we've rented out Tusculum Strike and Spare Bowling Alley in South Nashville on the evening of March 8th. And from 6.30 to 8.30, we just want you to be able to come and just have fun and just enjoy yourself. And so we've sent out an email to anyone who's ever volunteered before. We're communicating it on our blog and everything else. But if you're here and you've volunteered before and you haven't heard anything about this, we just want to make sure you know about it. You can talk to Brooks about it this morning. If you've volunteered before, you know who Brooks is. Grab him, ask any questions that you have. But we need you to RSVP or fill out the form by March 3rd so that we can know who all is planning to come to that. It'll be a really fun evening uh, together and just a way to say thank you to all of you who have given your time and your efforts. One last update. Uh, before we get into the Word, I know last week Dave kind of shared with you that uh, the elders uh, of, of our church family and the leadership team of our family were going to get away this week for a retreat. And um, <clears throat> we just, we just want to thank you. I, I, I was so amazed and so touched uh, by the number of text messages, emails, phone calls that we received. And I heard this from uh, many of our leaders that we just heard, we heard from you, like that you were praying for us, that you were with us. And we want you to know like how much that, it means so much for us to get away and spend a couple days seeking the Lord for clarity for our church family and what's next, and to know that there's solidarity amongst our family and that you're praying for us. And we're so, so grateful. And we want you to know your prayers were answered. We had an incredible retreat, and we walked away with some real clarity. You know, I know it's been kind of weird, like everything feels uncertain, like we're losing the building in two months, what's going to happen? And there's been so much uncertainty. We walked away from the retreat with some real clarity on next steps, and we are so excited to tell you all about that next week. So next week... <laughs> If you want to know, if you want to know what the Lord showed us, we're going to come. We have some, you know, we just have some things we need to tighten down, some things we need to just get totally clarified. But we are so excited to share with you next week all that, that we think is coming, all that we think the Lord is doing. And I believe it's really exciting. I, I'm so amazed by how God is leading us through this whole transition. And you've been such a big part of that, just in your prayers and your faithfulness and just your hearts and your attitudes. So we thank you. Thank you so much. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray for us. <clears throat> Bear with me. Uh, I feel like my voice is kind of fading. I don't know why. We'll see what happens. I'm going to ask the Lord right now. Maintain my voice. 
Let's pray, and we're going to jump into the Word together. Lord, I love you. Father, you, are, you really are just so good to us, so kind. I've, been, I've had so much fun this morning. It was so fun at the 9 a.m., just, just seeing people worship, just hearing the stories, how people are, are seeing you work in their lives. It is like an effortless thing to tell you, I love you, Lord. And Lord, I love this church family. I'm, I mean it, Father. I'm so grateful for this body of believers. I'm so grateful for the, the heart for you I see. I'm so grateful for the hunger, the communal hunger I see for you, for your word, uh, for your spirit to move. Father, we, we want you, Lord. We want you to move. We want you to lead us. We don't want to operate on our own agendas. Father, we don't want to come in here and pretend like we're doing all these great things to change. Lord, we know any change, any transformation, any growth, any hope, any peace, any comfort, Lord, any of these things, they come from you. So we thank you. Lord, I pray this morning, uh, just as I did at, at the nine, I pray again, um, Lord, in a message that could feel mundane or uh, just, just kind of, Lord, the, the practicals, mechanical, Lord, I pray that it would not feel that way. I pray that this morning, that as we talk about moving beyond a season of fasting, it would feel anything but mundane or mechanical, Lord, but you would, you would infuse it with life from your Holy Spirit. Just teach us, Lord, be here in our midst. Help our hearts to be ready to receive all you have for us. And pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So several years ago, I, uh, I had, a, you know, had an injury, you know, I injured myself. I had the, the blessing of playing on a flag football team with uh, some of the Ethos staff, and uh, it was really fun. We all, uh, once a week, would have a flag football game, and we all went out and pretended that we were still in high school, and we weren't, and uh, the natural thing happens when older people pretend that they're still in high school, and I remember we had a game on a Thursday night, and that next Sunday... We showed up and like multiple of us were injured. It was so funny. We showed up on a Sunday morning and I remember Brooks had like a brace on his knee. Dave had like a splint on his finger. I had my arm in a sling. Like every single one of us like got injured on the football field on Thursday night. And my injury was, it was, it was epic. You know, it was like I was reminded immediately of that I'm not 18 anymore. I, my injury came, uh, my shoulder injury came when I was literally just running down the field. That's it. I didn't have the football. I wasn't chasing anybody with the football. I'm just like running, <laughs> slipped and hit my, <laughs> landed on my shoulder and walked off the field like, oh, it hurts so bad. And I remember like trying to figure out, maybe it's a small thing. And I let Sydney Clayton, Dave's wife, look at it. She's a physical therapist. And she was like, oh, I'm pretty sure you have like a minor tear in your labrum in your shoulder. And I'm like, what? Like, well, how did this happen? I was literally just running on a field. And so she said, yeah, you need to get into physical therapy as soon as possible. So I began the joy and the pleasure of physical therapy. I don't know if any of you have ever been to physical therapy when you have an injury. But, you know, you go to a physical therapist and what they do is they start kind of poking around wherever the injury is and they want you to take that injured part of your body and move it around a lot. Like you need to move it and it doesn't feel good at all. It hurts. And they start giving you these exercises that are supposed to, you know, strengthen that part of your body. And here's the thing about physical therapy exercises. It's so funny. Like, if I'm going to exercise, I want to exercise in a way that I can feel it making a difference, you know? Like, I want to feel my muscles getting bigger while I work out, which you can probably tell just by looking, you know? Like, I'm really into working out. But, you know, when I exercise, when I exercise, it's like, man, I want to feel the return, right? Physical therapy, they're like, all right, here's a rubber band, and uh, I want you to put that in. This is your spot right here, man. Just do this with that rubber band. You're just going to move your arm back and forth, back and forth, and it feels like it's doing nothing. But the reality, the thing about physical therapy is this, is that you're doing these small little exercises that are accomplishing things under the surface, small things under the surface that make the biggest of differences. And so I went to physical therapy for like a month, month and a half, and wouldn't you know, by the end of it, the pain in my shoulder was, was relieved, and all I did was do this thing with a rubber band, you know, over and over again. But I got to the end of physical therapy. If you've ever been to physical therapy, you know this, the end, you know what happens. Physical therapist looks at you and says, hey, you've done really well. You're getting stronger. Uh, we're not going to schedule any appointments, any more appointments. But beyond this point, guess what you have to do? <laughs> Keep doing the what? Keep doing the exercises. Keep doing the things. I'm like, yeah, man, I'm, I'm all over that. Like, I am going to do those exercises. And, and let me tell you, I got past physical therapy, and guess what I did not do? Did not do the exercises, and guess what happened? Guess what happened? 
the pain came back, right? It came back. And I ended up having to go back like two years later. Because the reality is there's this thing when you, when you engage in those little, seemingly small exercises that seem to do nothing, there's something happening under the surface. And I believe in so many ways what we've been doing over the past month, it is like a spiritual picture of what it's like to go to physical therapy. We have all given ourselves to a process, and there's been these intentional things laid out for us, like, hey, here's a daily prayer call. Hey, here's a daily reading plan. Every week, hey, there's a, there's a prayer vigil this week. Hey, there's prayer stations at the office this week. Hey, there's 24, 24 hours of prayer this week. All these things that are laid out for us daily and weekly, and it's these small things, and they start to make a difference under the surface that we begin to see the fruit of it in our lives. And I believe that so many, I've talked to so many of us in our church family who go, man, God has done something in me this month. God has begun something. He started something in my heart. And it feels so weird because all we did was these small, seemingly insignificant things that make differences under the surface that show big changes in our lives. And the question we have to ask is, what will we do at the end of a season like this? Because our tendency, I think, is to treat it like I did physical therapy. You know, I get to the end of it, and I didn't want to do the exercises anymore. And if we do that, there's this thing that can happen. We slip right back into life as normal, and all the things that God has begun doing in our heart, they start to slip to the wayside. Because the reality is God is moving. He has been moving. God is it's like the Holy Spirit is like the wind that's blowing over a sailboat, but as long as the sail's sitting on the deck of the boat, that boat is not going anywhere. See, awaken is this time of the year where we are intentionally given some handles to know how to put the sail up to capture the wind of the Holy Spirit so he can take us where he wants to take us. But the question we have to ask is, how will we continue into that which he has begun? Here's this promise that we find in Scripture. I think it's so beautiful. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6 says this. The Apostle Paul writes, he says, I am confident of this. The Apostle Paul, he says that he, God, who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus. As we come to the end of Awakening, do you know this is the promise that God has made? He says, that thing I've started in you, that new affection, that, that new de desire, that new delight you have in me, that, that new hunger you have for me, that thing I started in you, I will carry it to completion until the day you see Jesus descending on the clouds. Like I'm going I'm to carry it out. But the invitation he gives us is, to go, hey, will you keep putting the sail up? And this morning we're talking about how do we do that? What does that look like? And I think that's what Jesus is speaking into in John chapter 15. So John chapter 15, I, I love, we're going to look at one verse this morning. Now, if you want to have an understanding of Jesus' heart, what Jesus desires for his uh, followers... I encourage you, spend some time in John chapter 14 through John chapter 17. It's the last conversation that Jesus has with his closest friends before he goes to the cross. And you just capture a heart for what it is that Jesus is longing for for all of us as we try to lean into life with him. It's an amazing portion of scripture. We're just going to really laser focus in on one verse right in the middle of that chunk. And it's John 15 uh, verse 5. John chapter 15 verse 5, this is what Jesus says. He says, I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you, I'm sorry, I wanted to read it. I want to keep going. It's one verse, Aaron, one verse. Slow down, dude, slow down, one verse. So there it is, a real simple verse, right? I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit, but apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, Jesus gives us this beautiful metaphor right off the bat. He says, listen, here's what I want you to understand I'm the vine, you're the branch. Understand who we are in relationship to one another. I'm the source. I'm the source of every good thing, every good blessing, every good fruit, every good change, every good transformation, everything you've experienced in me, I'm the source of it. And so he gives us these three simple instructions in relation to that metaphor. The first one is this. He says, hey, because I'm the vine and because you're the branch, number one, uh, remain in me. Remain in me. Now, I actually, I don't like, that's the, the New International Version's translation of that word Jesus used is remain. I actually don't love that word as a translation for this. Some of your Bibles may have the word abide. I, I feel like the word remain is a little too static. Kind of just sounds like, you know, if I tell my kid, like, hey, hey, stay right there, don't go anywhere. So it's like, this just kind of this, like, just stand there. I love the word abide. There's this, this, there's almost like a verb to it. It is abide in me. 
dwell in me, live in me. Jesus says the invitation, he's like, I'm the vine, you're the branch, and I want you just to abide, like all of your life, all of your dwelling, all that you do, just abide right here with me. Be with me. This is Jesus' invitation. It's what he, what he longs for for us, is for us just to abide in him. That's why we start experiencing fruit on a month like this, because we start making time to abide in Jesus. Simple little things that might feel like those meaningless reps on a rubber band, 30 minutes on a prayer call in the morning. Jesus is going, you're abiding in me. You're abiding. Abide in me. Spend time in my word. Abide in me. Number two, he says, abide in me, number one. Number two is this. He says, and you will bear much fruit. You'll be fruitful. How many of us want our lives to be described as fruitful? Like, wouldn't you love it if people looked at your life and they're like, man, what a fruit-filled life. What a fruitful life. I mean, I don't, I, I don't want somebody to look at my life and be like, man, Aaron, what a withered life that dude lived. I mean, it was just withered up and dry. Like, I don't, that is not, not how I want to be described. I want people to look at my life and go, wow, what a fruitful life. And, and you may be going, well, what does that mean? What kind of fruit? I think there's, this is, this is why Jesus was such a genius. Like, he was such a great teacher. He used metaphors all the time. Anytime you use a metaphor like this, man, you could just, you could go so deep and mining out all the different meanings. But I'll give you two simple handles of what he means. Jesus is saying, hey, do you want to have a spiritually fruitful life? In other words, you know, the Bible will tell us that the fruit of the Holy Spirit in our lives is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness gentleness and self-control and faithfulness. Like, do you want your life, someone to look at your life and go, man, that person's full of that kind of fruit. I see it in them. Like, that's how I want, man, I want my life to be marked by that kind of fruit. Jesus says, abide in me. Just abide in me. Like, stay near to me. You know, so that's the spiritual fruit. But I also think there's what I would call gospel fruit or kingdom fruit. I think there's something else here. He's going, listen, if you will abide in me and bear the spiritual fruit, did you know that others will actually see that in your life and they will come to know me through you? He says, listen, if you will abide in me, the goodness of your life will just ooze out of who you are. People will see it. That's why we're called the aroma of Christ. Because when we abide in him, the goodness of who he is just overflows out of us and people will see it. And we have opportunity to help those who are far from Christ because of sin or because of unbelief to see the goodness of who he is and to be attracted to want to come back and abide in the vine they were meant to abide in. So he says, abide in me. You'll bear fruit, spiritual fruit, kingdom fruit. And then the third part, so it's abide. You'll bear much fruit. And the third part of this, he says, apart from me. You can do nothing. And we go, man, Jesus, that sounds kind of harsh. <laughs> sounds kind of demeaning a little bit, like you think I'm worthless. No, that's, not, that's not what Jesus is saying here. You know, Jesus is trying to help us understand. He's going, listen, I, 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 the burning desire of his heart is time with you. That's what Jesus wants. You know that? He, he, he loves you. You know, that's the heart of the Father. Heart of Father God is that he loves you. He wants time with you. And he actually created us to function best that way. That when we get time with him, when we abide in him, we function the way we were meant to. He's not being controlling or demeaning. He's going, look, I made you. I know what's good for you. He's like, abide in me. But there's this other thing. You know, the truth is sometimes we can force fruit. Like we can try to force, I'm going to be kind, going to be kind, going to be happy, going to be joyful, going to be beloved. You know, like people can see phony fruit. Right? The truth is, guys, beloved, this is, this is so important, is that the world is full of people that bear the name of Jesus, and I've been guilty of this as well, and we put out phony fruit wanting people to see it, and then we try to convince them of how, Je how good Jesus is, and they're looking at us going, that's not real fruit. <laughs> you see, beloved, what happens is if we try to bear fruit on our own apart from Jesus, it's phony fruit. We, we have false positivity, false happiness, false joy. We have to put a bow on everything and pretend that everything's okay even when it's not because we're trying to be something that we're not. Beloved, 
True fruitfulness comes in abiding in Jesus if we try to do it. You know, in a minute, at the end of the sermon, I'm going to give you some practical things you can put into your life. Here's the truth. If you go put those practical things in your life, but it is devoid of rich affection for Jesus, desire for Jesus, you will bear phony fruit and people can see it from a mile away. And you'll feel it in your own life. Jesus isn't being demeaning. He just knows he's the source of real fruitfulness. So he says, hey, abide in me. You will bear fruit apart from me. You can do nothing. You know, there's a rhythm here that Jesus is tapping into. It's the rhythm of humanity. It goes like this. It's like abide with Jesus, bear fruit. Abide with Jesus, fruitfulness. Abiding in Christ, a fruitful life. This is the rhythm we were made for. Jesus is tapping into an ancient rhythm of humanity that can be found all the way back at the beginning of Scripture. Jesus, his Father, the Holy Spirit, working together, Yahweh God, to bring about creation. They created this entire thing with a rhythm around it. Here's what I mean. You read Genesis 1 and you see that God created the heavens and the earth and he created all that we can see. And on the sixth day of creation... He creates Adam and Eve, man and woman, humanity. Do you know that humanity was the crown, the the pinnacle, the crown jewel of God's creation? You know, if if you're new to the Bible or to, you know, Jesus or church or whatever, do do you know, if you want to know how God sees you, he looks at humanity and we were not just like a side thought that he had. He created all the incredible things we see in creation and humanity was the pinnacle or the apple of his eye crown jewel of his creation. But what I love is he created humanity on the sixth day. On the seventh day of creation, you know what God did? He rested. Not because he was tired and needed a break. God rested because he was fully satisfied with what he had made. But here's what this means. If humanity was made on the sixth day, and then on the seventh day, what was humanity's very first day of existence? What did they do? You know what they did? They rested. They rested. It's amazing. God creates them on the sixth day. He says, hey, I'm giving you this whole creation to steward and take care of it now. Day one, kick back and relax. <laughs> like, Just relax. Rest with me. Can you imagine if you got a job? Like you get the new job you've always wanted. You show up on the first day and your boss is like, all right, day one. All right, I just want you to relax. <laughs> Welcome to your new job. What do you like to eat? Lunch is on me today. I got it, man. I just want you to re- You like to play golf? Sweet. Go play a round of golf, I'll cover the tab, I got you. I just want you to spend your first day just relaxing and living your best you. Like, what if that's the way your boss responded to you? No way. That's not the way the world functions, right? You show up to a new job day one, you're expected to be ready, like jumping in and going. See, we have this belief in our society that the way, the rhythm of life is this. You work, 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 work until you need a break, and then you try to take a rest on the weekend, but you're so exhausted that you end up checking out and binging on Netflix all Friday night, and you're more tired Saturday morning, and you don't know why. Or we work, 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 and then we plan a vacation where we go away for a week, and on the vacation, we play, 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 and then we come home, and we wonder why we're still tired, and we go back to work, work, and we wonder why we suffer from burnout and exhaustion. We've bought into this lie that we work until we're tired and then we rest, but what the Bible holds out for us, the rhythm that Jesus holds for us is, no, 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 we were not made to rest from our work. We were created to work from our rest. Did you catch? We were created to work from our rest. Rest comes first. We abide in Jesus, we rest with Jesus, and then out of that, we work and bear fruit. We abide in Jesus, we rest in Jesus, and we bear fruit. This is the rhythm of creation that God has made us for. It's what he's created us for. This is why we start our year in prayer and fasting. It's not, God, we're going to start off our year. Please, please make it a really good year, God, please. (laughs) We're not like, no, it's, God, we want to just rest in you. I mean, I, I know it feels kind of crazy. You know, we're, we're losing our building in a couple months. <laughs> and what are we doing? We're like, God, Lord, we need you. It feels counterintuitive. But this is the way of Jesus. We seek him first. We start our year resting with him, seeking him. So h- how do we move into this? Moving out of awaken. What does it look like for us to keep living this life of abiding so that we can bear fruit? How do we allow God to keep carrying to completion the thing he started in us? I'm going to tell you, it starts in probably one of the least inspiring places you can think of. <laughs> it starts in one of the least inspiring places you can think of. You know that it actually starts 
with your daily calendar. Man, how uninspiring is that? Like your calendar, whether it's on one of these things or if you're still living in the 90s and you got a paper planner, you know, like that, this is where the abundant life of transformation with Jesus, it, it actually begins with the power of your calendar. You're like, man, my calendar does not feel very powerful. <laughs> I'm just going to tell you, there is power when you understand how life with Jesus can actually begin with how you leverage your calendar. Let me explain what I'm going to give you a framework to understand this. There's a guy named uh, Stephen Covey. Uh, he wrote a book called Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. A lot of you probably heard of him. He was a really famous leadership guy in, in the 90s and 80s. And he would do this presentation that he would get people together for like a conference or a teaching or whatever, and he had this presentation where a table would be laid out, and he would have a jar, like two jars on the table. And then with the table, he would have a pile of kind of bigger rocks and some pebbles and then some sand and like a glass of water. And he would invite people up, to, and he would say, I want somebody to come up here and try to get all of these materials into this jar. And inevitably, somebody would come up, and they'd pick up the sand, and they'd pour that in the jar first, and then they'd throw in the pebbles, and then they'd put in the big rocks, and they'd get the water, and inevitably, the water would overflow and go all over the table, and they'd say, oh, they won't all fit. And it would look something like this. We've got a picture of these jars. And so, you know, somebody would come up, and their attempt would look something like the jar on the left. But then Stephen Covey would say, now, let me show you how this actually works. And he would, he would end up with the jar on the right, because he would take the big rocks, and he would put those in first. And then he would take the pebbles and he'd put those in and they would shake down into the small places that are on the big rocks. Then he'd get the sand and he'd pour the sand in and it would trickle down and fill in all the gaps. And then he would pour the water in and it'd always come right up to the top of that jar. And the metaphor was this. He'd say, listen, this jar, this vessel is your life. It is your day. You know, we all have the same size vessel. Every single one of us have 24 hours in a day. Nobody's got any more. Nobody's got any less. Did you know that Jesus himself, you know what he had? He had a 24-hour day. That's what he worked with. We all have a 24-hour day. He says the big rocks, the big rocks, these are the non-negotiable things in your life. These are the things that you would say really matter to you. So maybe that's your spiritual health, your relational health, your physical health, or maybe it's your job. He goes, these are the, the big things that should be, when they go on your calendar, they're immovable. Nothing can move them out of the way. These are the big rocks. The pebbles. These are the small tasks, the everyday life that you have to do, things that you need to do, maybe even things that you want to do, okay? These may be like your hobbies. This may be exercising. This may be home projects, you know? Maybe this is walking your dog. I, I know I just offended some of you because I said your dog is a pebble instead of a big rock. I'm sorry. I just think that's probably where he fits, you know? Anyways, it's a pebble, you know? Like, these are the pebbles. And then there's the, the sand. The sand is like the urgent stuff. These are the things that tend to fill up your life and your brain space, even though you don't want them to. The sand or the urgent things coming at you, like the telephone calls, it's, it's the text messages, it's that inbox that just keeps filling up. It is the glaring, loud, like social media notifications, all the buzzes and the whistles and the bells that are constantly fighting and vying for our attention in our life. This is the sand, the urgent. And then the water, the stuff that just comes at you. You don't plan for it. You don't really want it. It just comes at you. You know, the water is things like sitting in traffic on your commute to work, and it's taking longer than it normally does. It's going to the doctor, and you end up having a long, extended wait in the waiting room that you didn't anticipate, or going to get your emissions tested for your car, and it inevitably has that long line of cars you have to wait in. These things are the water. And see, the mistake that so many of us make with our calendars, with scheduling and planning our day, is that so many of us, we start with the urgent. We start our day with the urgent. And then, we, and then we try to get the tasks of everyday life. Beloved, I, 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 so many of us, are like we wake up in the morning and the first thing we do is we look at this thing. We pull out our phone and there's all these screaming notifications that want our response. And I'm just going to tell you, this is not like a pastor railing against social media or anything. I'm just brain science. This is, this is just true. If you wake up in the morning and the first thing you do is react to those urgent things coming at you out of your phone, you are training your brain. You're saying today is going to be a day of reaction and response instead of proactive intentionality. And your brain will function that way the rest of your day. It's just what you're doing. Like The moment you wake up, you are programming your brain for how your brain's going to function that day. 
This is why during this month we all experienced something different. Why? Because we had this, oh man, 30-minute prayer call in the morning that I can log into. Oh, a scripture that I can actually, man, when I wake up, I can start my time in this scripture. They seem like these small little things that don't seem to make that much of a difference, but under the surface, they're changing things that make big changes in our lives. And the invitation as we come out of awakening is going, man, what if we, what if we were those who chose to get our big rocks down first, to be intentional about prioritizing intimacy with Jesus, solitude with Jesus, time with Jesus, even though it seems small and insignificant in our life, do we have faith enough to believe that it will make the biggest of differences if we will lean totally in? Because the fruitfulness doesn't come on the bigness of our efforts, the fruitfulness comes because we choose to be still and abide in Jesus. Jesus, I start my day with you. Jesus, as I wake up, I don't look at my phone first. I pause, even sitting on the edge of my bed, and I just ask you, Lord, what do you have for my day? Jesus, I open the word with you this morning. This is a big rock for me. Time with you. I open the word. I read a psalm. I read a scripture. I take 10 minutes to just still my heart and be centered upon the goodness of Jesus and his words for me. Small reps, changing things under the surface that you cannot see that will make the biggest difference in the rest of your life. So as a move from awaken, I don't know what the things you changed in your daily routine are, but spoiler alert, I truly believe if you are a follower of Jesus, time with Jesus needs to be a big rock in your life. It needs to be one of those immovable things, just like if you were planning out your weekly calendar, you would put, you know, whatever date you have on Friday night, you would put whatever your work hours are, you would put breakfast, lunch, and dinner, all those would be on your calendar. Time with Jesus has got to be on our calendar, it's got to be an intentional thing. Literally, if you don't put it on there, it will not happen. And so the invitation coming out of Awaken is going, hey, what were the small reps that you did different for the last month? And how are you going to keep doing those? I give you three kind of categories of these reps. The first one is this, daily. What are the daily things you did this past month? Or the things that you, that you wanted to do and you did your very best to do them. Okay, we're not, we're not talking about perfection. It's about persistence, not perfection. What were the things that you put in? You may not have been perfect on them, but you put them in there and you tried. How will you continue those? You know, I, I talked about getting up, how you start your day. Some of you go, man, I've got to be out the door so early. It's so hard to find that time. It's like, okay, wh- where is the moment in your day where you can leverage it? Some of you did sun up to sundown fast these last few days at the beginning of the month, and you had this space in the middle of your day. What if, what if moving forward, I said, okay, Lord, on my lunch, I'm going to give 20 minutes just to being in your word as I eat lunch. I'm going to give that to you. Some of you have small children, and you go, man, do you know what my morning is like? I'm like, yeah, I've got four kids. I know exactly what your morning is like. I know exactly the chaos that ensues in the house. That's why we set breakfast aside as our family every morning at breakfast. Our house is total chaos, but there's this moment where we all sit down at the breakfast table, and it is there that my wife and I and our kids were working to memorize scriptures together. Some of you, you can't eat breakfast together, so maybe it's dinner together. Some of you have roommates, and it's like, man, how can you carve out time together with your roommates every single day where you're taking time to slow yourselves down and acknowledge the presence of God? I just want to encourage you, I challenge you, what is the daily thing that you can carry with you beyond awaken? But then after daily, it's like, what about weekly? You know, during the fast, during the fast, we had these weekly things. We had, we had the daily prayer calls and the daily scripture reading, but then we also had weekly, there were these prayer vigils that we were doing. There were prayer stations you were invited to participate in. There was a weekly gathering here. Many of you were tracking with a house church. And so I'd encourage you to go, hey, what is the weekly thing that I can lean into? Many of us need a weekly habit of just Sabbath, a day where I'm not responding to every email that comes in, a day where I put, my, I put it all aside and I trust that the Lord is going to take care of it if I honor him with that. Many of us need a day like that. But guess what? If it doesn't get on your calendar, it will never happen. So there's daily rhythms. There are weekly rhythms. And last one, I would say yearly rhythms. You know, here, here's what I do. I know when I look at my calendar for a year, my goal, what I want to do is have at least one or two times that I get away for a day, 
half a day or two days, whichever one I can make happen, half a day, a day, or two days, where I can get away into solitude with God. Now, you know, Dave talked last week all about solitude. <clears throat> We're giving you some handles on how you can actually make solitude with Jesus a reality in your life and not just a, an idea. I know that every year, if I want a day away with God in solitude, it's got to get on my calendar. If it doesn't go on my calendar, guess what happens? Not going to do it. Not going to happen. So I would encourage you, like the power of your calendar, you get to decide the big rocks in your life. Jesus is going, hey, abide in me. Abide in me. Some of you are going, a day away with God? How would I do that? Like, We've got some resources I would love to provide you. Like, if you have never spent a day or half a day or extended hours just alone with God, there's a tool that we're going to post on our blog this week that will help you to do that. But before you can ever use the tool, you've got to make a plan to get that big rock on your calendar to make it happen. The invitation coming out of Awaken is just to abide. But in order to abide, we've got to lean all the way in to Jesus as he says, come on, spend time with me. Abide with me. In just a minute, I'm going to send you <clears throat> to communion and just give you the simple question, kind of a challenge to think through, hey, what is one daily rhythm that you've leaned, in, leaned into over this past month that you can continue to lean into? And I'm going to invite you to pray for one another. But before we do that, I want to just connect this back just to the heart so we understand. Anytime we talk about, like, it's, it feels so unspiritual. Like, wait, you're telling me to put things on my calendar, spend time? I thought, you know, it's like, but... Here's, here's the reality. The, the heart behind this matters so much. The heart behind it matters so much. You know, we started off this journey of prayer and fasting. I don't know if you remember, but the week before we started Awaken, I got up here and I preached on desire. And I talked about how fasting is this time where we start to recalibrate the desires of our heart. And I kind of want to tie it up here at the end, not by talking about our desires. We've kind of spent some time recalibrating our desires. I want to land the plane here at the very end just by talking about what is it that God desires? Did you know that God has desires? If somebody were to ask you, what is the burning desire of God's heart? What would you say? You know, some of you, some of you may feel like, man, I think that God's burning desire is that I would just obey and get my life together. That's your perception of God. Is he's just watching you. He's just, man, I wish you'd just get your life together. Some of you might go, no, 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 no. I think the burning desire of God's heart, it is peace. It's justice. It's righteousness. Yeah, I think those things, yeah, for sure. Those are the desire of God's heart. But what, what is the thing underneath the thing? What is the burning desire that drives God? You know, my oldest son, Elijah, when he first started reading chapter books, he came to me uh, several months after he started reading, and he says, <clears throat> Dad, here's how I read a book. When I get a new book, I open it up, and I read the first few pages. And then I flip all the way to the back, and I read the last few pages so I can see how it ends. And I was like, well, that's a terrible idea. <laughs> It's like your entire life is one big spoiler. Like you're just never surprised by anything that happens, you know. And I was just kind of talking with him about, but I started thinking about it. And I went, you know, that's actually not a bad strategy if you want to understand this book. If you want to understand the burning desire of God's heart, just read the first few pages of Genesis and read the last few pages of Revelation. Because here's what you see. The burning desire of God's heart at the very beginning the very beginning, God has created everything. He's made Adam and Eve. They've got this day of rest. And we find this picture in Genesis 3 where God is literally just walking in the garden with Adam and Eve. He's dwelling with his people. And guess what you see when you get to the very end in Revelation 21? It's the same thing. Revelation 21 says that now God's dwelling is with his people. And he will be the one to wipe every tear from every eye. The burning desire, you've got to hear this if you don't know it's true, the burning desire of God's heart is to be with you, to dwell with you, to abide with you, and for you to abide with him. This is what drives him. He loves you. And so as you come to communion this morning, and you ask this question, like, what's that rhythm I'm going to lean into? It's not a chore. No, it's more, it's like, there is a, the almighty spiritual being, the almighty divine being of the universe and all of creation adores you. He loves you. And he longs for time with you. And it's going, how will I lean all the way in so I can abide in him? And the bread and the cup are the reminder that he has paid every price to make it possible. Your sin doesn't disqualify you. Your failures don't disqualify you. Your mess-ups in the past don't disqualify you. He's going, abide in me. I've paved the way. So I'm going to pray for us. I'm going to send us to communion. And then we'll have a slide on the screen with a question. Just spend some time answering that question and praying for one another as we move forward. Lord, we love you. 
Thank you, Lord, for this promise that you long to abide, to dwell with us. I thank you, Lord, it's just so simple. The Lord, in the places where we're seeking transformation, in the places that we're seeking change, that it's just, hey, abide. Don't go try to do all the, don't go try to do all this, just abide, be with me. Help us, Lord. Will you grow our desire for you? Grow our love for you. Help us to love you the way you love us. And would you lead us, Lord, that we would grow in our affection for you, our desire for you, and our delight in you, Father. Come, Lord, come as we commune with you. Would you dwell here in our midst? In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. So you can go ahead and make your way to the bar or the tables. Grab the cup, grab the bread. Bring it back to your seats, and there's slides going up on the screen. You'll see this question. Just take some time to answer this question with one another and to pray for one another. If you would like prayers, we'll have men and women at the Respond Banner over here. We, we would love to pray with you, pray for you in any way that would bless you. I love you all very much. Let's just commune together.
and I'm still in your presence. All the noise dies down. Lord, speak to me now. You have all my attention. I will linger and listen. I can't miss a thing. Cause Lord, I know my heart wants more of you. My heart wants something new. So I surrender all. And all I want is to live within your love. Be undone by who you are. My desire is to know you. Lord, I will open up again, throw my fears into the wind. I am desperate for a touch of heaven.
you just grab a seat real quick if you don't mind it'll take just a minute man what a gift to get a worship together today you know our mission here is to love God love people and to awaken a movement and there's so many simple ways we try to step into that day in day out week in week out tonight at five o'clock I want to encourage you just come come be with us we're going to have kind of this this wrap-up celebration for the month that we've been in we're going to worship we're going to have time of testimony baptism time to be prayed over and to pray with others 
If uh, you're here this morning and you go, man, I'm interested in taking a step, I want to be baptized tonight. Show up tonight, 5 o'clock, we'll have everything that you need. It's going to be a great celebration. Uh, if you have questions, you can fill out one of these cards that's in your seat this morning. You can hand it to me personally or drop it in one of the white gift mailboxes. We'd love to connect with you, even just on the phone this afternoon. Make sure you understand what it is that you're stepping into. And so we'd love to have that conversation. So tonight at 5 o'clock, baptisms, we love to end every fast with a feast and so our house church you know on Tuesday night we're going to get together we're going to eat a ton of great food we're going to celebrate and talk about what God's doing I want to encourage you if you show up tonight afterwards to find somebody and to go out and to eat afterwards you know maybe there's that girl you've been wanting to ask on a date and it's like this is a great opportunity to do it as though you care about her journey of fasting I'm just joking um, speaking of dating Next month, we've got a new grow class that's going to be launching. It's going to be an amazing opportunity where uh, we're going to just be talking about Jesus and romance and sex and how do we follow Christ in the midst of this season, in this moment that we're in. We're going to give you more information about it. It's going to be so, so impactful. So just kind of keep your ears open for that. I think it's going to be really good. Uh, some of you joined Ethos or started kind of getting connected with Ethos in the midst of the, the last two years, kind of this strange COVID era that we've been in. And one of the things that we're so well aware of, and we know you're aware of this, is, man, this has been a crazy, difficult season to find great connection, to find great community. And we're really aware of that. In the midst of that, you know, we're moving locations and all of this stuff. But one of the things that we used to do every month is we had this thing called open house where we'd, we'd feed you dinner. Uh, we, we'd keep it kind of small, you know, 30, 40 people and give you the opportunity to meet with some leaders, take next steps, get connected, find out how you can use your gifts here. Uh, mark your calendars March 8th at 6 p.m. at our Ethos offices. We have another open house, and we're going to start uh, doing this regularly again. If you are new to Ethos in the last two years, I want to just encourage you, before you leave today, stop by the Connect banner, uh, use your phone to sign up via the QR code, and we'll get you all the information that you need. Um, if you can't make it in March, we have others that are coming up as well, but don't use that as a lame excuse to not come in. So, you know, don't just go, oh, I'll do it again later. If you can come, come. We'd love to connect with you. Um, so that that's that's happening March 8th. Grow classes launching in March. Baptism celebration tonight. So much fun stuff. If you haven't had the opportunity to join us at the prayer room today, you still have until 5 o'clock tonight. Come join us. We'd love to get a pray together. So here's here's why I had you sit down. Um, because I know sometimes we're such creatures of habit, and you guys are amazing at the 11 o'clock. Normally, we fold up our chairs, we clean this room up. Do not fold up your chairs today, please, because we need them tonight. And so if you could just do us a favor, if you're not going to use the baptism cards and the pins that are in your seat, just grab those and put those on the bar neatly, and you're dismissed. We'll see you tonight at 5. Love you guys. Great getting to worship together today. Hey, can we just thank the band for leading us this morning? They did an awesome job. You guys are amazing. See ya. See you tonight.